Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Collecting the King show. This is episode eight, and this one is called There's Gold in the Mountains, and we'll tell you why in just a minute. When I did the show in Memphis, and I did it for like 25 years, it was one of my favorite things about doing the show was being able to talk to people, you know, when they came to the show and just have great conversations about, you know, collecting and what they found and, uh, you know, the hunt, uh, looking for things and, and, and the results and, and then finding new stuff. I mean, it was, it was always the best part for me at the Collecting the King show in Memphis um, to, to do that. And I look forward to this and I, I hope you do too. We get a lot of comments and I appreciate the collectors out there who have additional information regarding things that we talk about. And one in particular, uh, I don't have the name of the person right now off the top of my head. Cause I can't remember if it was an email or a comment, but we were doing, when we did the episode, I think we were doing one on uh, reissues and we were talking about the differences in covers and things like that. And even, even I learned something. I mean, after all the 25, 30 years I've been doing this, you know, I had made a statement about this album here. We'll show you what it is. And uh, let's see if this is Elvis for everyone. And uh, I had made a, a comment that this album, uh, for some reason, RCA never changed the cover throughout the years. After I had said that about the cover, somebody wrote either in a comment or an email to me, correcting me, saying that, as a matter of fact, they did change the cover at a certain point, but they changed it on the back. Um, this, you'll see, has a bunch of Elvis albums, of course, showing his catalog. And what's interesting is this is a first pressing you're looking at, and you'll notice all the albums are um, outlined in gold. Now, in the later issues, and I'm assuming we're talking like around the 80s, because I checked and I noticed my orange and my uh, tan labels uh, didn't change. But after that, when Elvis for Everyone came out, they actually changed from gold to a yellow. Because I actually ran across a, uh, a late pressing, and I was looking at the back, and I said, I wonder what that guy was talking about, and then it all made sense. So first, let's talk about one of the most exciting things about collecting, and that is the hunt. Collectors know where to look, and a good example of those places are like record stores, of course, flea markets, antique malls, secondhand stores, and Goodwill, just to name a few. Sometimes you find things in the most unlikely places, and we'll get to that in a little bit. I, I took a trip for, I think it was my wedding anniversary, and I think it was the 30th wedding anniversary, pretty sure, and uh, we had took a trip to L.A., and of course, there's many, many record stores in L.A., so we went out and just you know, hit a few here and there. And all of a sudden I was in this one store and this one guy who owns the store recognized me. And he says, aren't you the Elvis guy who does the book with Jerry Osborne? And I said, yeah, I am. And we struck up a little bit of conversation. And, and then he said, uh, so what are you looking for? And I says, oh, you know, the usual stuff, rare stuff. And he says, you want to see something rare? I'll show you something rare. I said, sure. So he goes in the back room. He comes out with this, Aloha from Hawaii album, and right away I noticed there was something different about it because there was this sticker on it that was the size of like a postcard. And I mentioned this sticker before on my show about stickers stuck on you, but the thing about this sticker was it was a sticker that the Colonel had put on certain copies of the uh, album, and they were passed out or given away as a freebie at uh, at the hotel. So. The guy shows it to me. I, I go into shock, and I'm like, well, what do you want for it? And without going into a bunch of numbers, it wasn't cheap. <laughs> so it was kind of like one of those things like, eh, do I really want to spend that much money? But you know what? That's, that's the thing about it is when you find something really rare, you have, to, you have to decide sometimes right then and there if you're going to put the money up and grab it. You know, my advice is anytime you see something incredibly rare that you've never seen before, I would say if there's any way to get it, get it. Of course, try to negotiate, which I did. I tried to negotiate the price down, but couldn't get him down. So I knew that if I was going to buy this thing, I would have to get it and pay what he wanted. And I did, and I got it. And uh, 
uh, I ended up selling it pretty quick, I think within a week or so. I can't say how much it went for, but I will say it was in the thousands. So it, it's probably, if I hadn't said this before in the other show, it's probably one of the rarest and most valuable stickers on Elvis albums that there is. You know, talk about gold in the mountains. That one was, that was gold. Again, I was in another state uh, on a vacation with my wife, and um, we hit this antique mall, and it was kind of like, I think it was one of the first times we went into it. We saw it several times on previous trips, and uh, we said, you know, let's just go check it out. So we went in, started looking around, and there was a cabinet that was was filled with Elvis stuff, Okay. But this was insignificant Elvis stuff, okay? This was like Elvis, you know, shot glasses and thimbles and uh, uh, Elvis uh, napkins, all the stuff uh, that had no value whatsoever. So I almost passed it up. I just kind of looked at everything and started walking away. But then all of a sudden, something caught my eye. There was something in the back of the cabinet. It was a How Great Thou Art picture disc. And it had the cover of the album on one side. Back in the 70s, RCA was doing a lot of experimental stuff. And they, they uh, you know, like the multicolored moody blues, the different colors beyond blue. And then there's a gold and a red and a yellow. And then and then earlier than that, they, they were doing some experiments with uh, picture discs. Uh, and this is an example of one that everybody knows about. And this is the legendary performer uh, picture disc which came out, I think, in 78. I think RCA was planning on doing this, so they were testing all these different uh, uh, record covers and and things just to see what a picture disc would look like uh, for the time when they actually released this album. That being said, I knew they tested a picture disc using Legend of Former 1 and 2. So what I did was I, uh, I, I, I made a note of the runoff numbers uh, that that were on the picture disc. And I remember I didn't buy it right away because, again, I wasn't really sure if this was the real thing. It was an RCA factory thing. I remember going out to my car and uh, looking up um, Legendary Performer Volume 2 to see if I could find it because I had, I had some stuff on my phone and I was able to track down the number. And the numbers matched. So I knew right away that, okay, this was definitely an RCA press thing, and it was probably Legendary Performer Volume 2. Now, fortunately, this this one did not cost a lot. It was a little bit more than I would like to have gotten it for, but it wasn't as much as the record, <laughs> the Aloha from Hawaii, okay? So I definitely went back in. I bought it, and, of course, one of the first things I did when I got home was played it, to make sure I was right, and I was. So this was pretty cool. I found this and uh, ended, up, ended up taking it with me to Memphis uh, one year. And uh, I remember in the show, it was kind of a little bit of the talk of the show because nobody had ever seen it before. And I, I remember I did end up selling it to a guy named Chris. And I believe I have a picture of me shaking hands with him when he bought it. And, uh, you know, it went for a fairly good price. And, and th those type of albums do. I mean, those experimental picture discs and things like that usually go for, you know, anywhere from 1000 to $1,500. i am sure the person who had this thing didn't know what they had because it was messed in with a bunch of really insignificant Elvis memorabilia, you know, after-death memorabilia that's really almost worthless. Um, but here it was sitting by itself, and uh, uh, who knows how it got there. Sometimes it pays to network. A lot of people like to stay in touch with everybody. And especially when I was in Memphis and doing the show, I, made, I met a lot of people from around the world who I became friends with or Elvis friends with and who knew me from the price guide, knew me from the show. And I always stayed in contact with a lot of people and uh, especially a lot of the people in the Netherlands and people in the UK. But anyway, it's always good to have a connection with somebody. So networking will lead you down the road or the path to a gold mine every once in a while. I made friends with a dealer by the name of Dennis Jeske, who uh, unfortunately uh, is no longer with us. He passed away. 
and one of the great guys, I mean, one of the best guys I, I've, I've ever met. And he was so friendly and uh, he was a lot of fun. And he loved Elvis. Now, Dennis had his own store in San Diego. And my wife and I uh, went to California one time and then drove down to San Diego. And we actually went to his store. His store was fantastic. I mean, it was one of the most perfect, beautiful record stores I'd ever seen in my life. Never seen anything like it. Uh, I remember us going there and... Uh, he, he was always such a fun guy. And uh, I, I remember I was looking for a Speedway album. And I, saw a, I, I found a Speedway album there, and it was sealed. And I remember saying to him, oh, I, this must be a, a, a second pressing, because there's no sticker on there, so the photo's not in there, right? And he goes, no. He smiled, and he says, no, the photo's in there. And I said, well, you don't know that the photo's in there. I mean, RCA pulled the stickers off, so how would you know the photo was in there? He goes, trust me, the photo's in there. And he had this big smile on his face. I'll never forget. And the more I pursued it, the more he, he thought it was hysterical. And he just kept laughing and laughing. You know, it, it, it might have been the fact that we were in the back of his store. And here is a, a, a shrink wrap machine. <laughs> so that must have been what he was talking about. Because he finally said, no, no, I know it's in there because I put it in there. Now, Dennis wasn't trying to fool anybody or anything. And I, I asked him, well, you know, you're not supposed to do that. He said, I know. He says, but he said, you know, the thing about my store is, you know, I can't put the photo just in, a, a, you know, a baggie or, or a piece of plastic because somebody could rip off the photo. I said, oh, okay. He said, I, so what I do is I shrink wrap it and put the photo in and then I'll tell somebody the photo's in there. All right. Well, whatever his logic was, that that's what he said. So anyway... My story goes like this. I'm at home after that trip. I can't remember how long after that. I get a phone call from Dennis. He calls me up and he says, listen, I just met this guy and I just got this record that I think you might be interested in. And I said, really, what is it? And he said, well, it's a GI Blues picture disc. And I said, GI Blues, there's no GI Blues picture disc. And he says, well, yeah, there is. He says, I have it in front of me right now. I'm looking at it. And we went back and forth because I, I've never, at that point, I had never heard of a, a, an experimental picture disc, especially when he told me the cover was an old original GI Blues cover, but it was probably from the UK or German because it had a different RCA logo. It was the Lightning Bolt logo, which they use over there. And I said... Well, I got to see it. So I remember he sent me pictures of it, and I freaked out. I thought, oh, my God, this thing's beautiful. I said, so where, where did you get it from? And he says, well, I got it from this guy named Ed Bonja. And everybody probably who's watching this show has heard of Ed Bonja. He was uh, Elvis' uh, photographer, and uh, he, um, he he's took some fantastic pictures. A lot of his pictures are on albums uh, like Elvis Now. So apparently, I don't know how he, he met him or ran into him, and somehow he got the picture disc, and he says, if you want it, this is how much money I want for it. I knew it was pretty special, and coming from Ed Bonja, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get it. So I gave him the money, bought it. It wasn't cheap, folks, so I did not get it for like 10 bucks, and I was going to keep it. I was really proud of it. I even had a picture taken of me holding the album, and uh, I, I thought, you know what? This is going to be unique. I'm going to keep this for myself. You know, and because it, it was just so cool. And I remember when, when I found it, it caused a lot of controversy because, you know, there was this competitive dealer that was saying, oh, that's fake. It's a bootleg. It's no good. I mean, it can't, it's not RCA, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know if he was just jealous or what, but he kept saying, well, I have one too, you know, and one of these days I'll show you. And it was just a bunch of crap. So I ended up selling it and uh, I can, I can say I sold it to my friend, Gary Brown, who now is the proud owner of it. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was, it's such a great piece that we included it in the book. And, and you'll notice it's a long, remember those picture discs I'm talking about? 
look at right up there. There's some more of those picture discs that they made from Legendary Performer and a couple other things. But there, this is a great example of those, you know, experimental picture discs. And quite frankly, it's worth a lot of money. Uh, again, well into the thousands. So that was a great feeling finding that. And I didn't sell it right away. Like I said, I kept it for a while. I liked it. It was, you know, kind of my pride and joy for a long time. But again, bills come along and you got to pay those bills. So I, I like saving the best for, for last. And I'm calling this the, the most unlikely place ever to find a rare item this folks this story <laughs> when i tell this story i can't believe it but this is exactly what happened it was the playoffs the bulls were playing the jazz utah jazz my brother had called me up one night and said how would you and carol like to come and meet me at a bar now there was this bar uh i used to work at in uh i think it's in blue island where i was born and raised and um I used to work there as a DJ. So we hopped in the car. We, we drove up there. So we go into this place. And right away, my, my old boss, the guy that hired me that, that I worked for, comes up and he goes, hey, how you doing? Everything uh, great, great, great. And so what do you do now? What, what do you do? And I, and I said, well, uh, you know, it, it's hard to say you're an Elvis Presley dealer. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, that just doesn't sound credible for some reason, you know. Even today, when I say, when people say, what did you do for 25 years? Well, I was an Elvis Presley dealer. And they look at me like, yeah, so you weren't, you were insignificant, huh? <laughs> it's like, I'm not a doctor or a lawyer or anything like that. I told him, I said, I'm an antique dealer. He goes, oh, antique dealer, okay, all right. And he kind of walked away. So here I am, we're sitting in the bar watching the game, and then, uh, uh, he comes back up, my, my old boss comes back up, and he starts telling me about how he's going to open up a, a bar in Las Vegas. And, um, and he said, so you're an antique dealer, huh? He says, let me show you something. Come with me. So I follow him. We go into his office. He reaches into this cabinet. First, he pulls out an Elvis Presley scarf, which is obviously a souvenir one with a facsimile signature on it, not a real one. I think he pulled out another thing, which was like a, a menu or something. And then the last thing he pulled out, he says, have you ever seen his autograph? And I said, mm, yeah, I've seen it. And he says, well, here it is. So he pulls out this, what appears to be a contract or a document of some sort. The second page, down at the bottom, there's two signatures, one in a black marker, uh, with, uh, and the name was Alex Shufi. And right underneath in a pen, it says Elvis Presley. Folks, I got to tell you, I think I I was just about to faint. It was a contract uh, for Elvis to play, op open the International Hotel. And the date on the contract was April 15th, I believe, 1969. Now, I know enough about Elvis that I know that he was going to open the International Hotel, but Barbara Streisand actually ended up opening it because the colonel, he wanted somebody else to go and test run, you know, the opening of the hotel. And so Barbara Streisand ended up doing that. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, oh my God, this is incredible. And I just said, so what, uh, how did you get this? And he says, well, there's a guy that comes in here all the time and his sister uh, who's passed away, used to work at the International Hotel in Las Vegas. And she collected autographs. And he says, so are you interested in the scarf? <laughs> he, he thought the scarf was the big deal. So I said, well, let me think about it. So I, we, I went out. I remember I went to grab something to eat. And uh, as we're walking down the street, my wife will tell you, I was jumping up and down like a little kid. And I'm like, oh my God, you're not going to believe what's in that guy's office. It's, it's the contract for Elvis to return to live performing. I mean, you're not going to believe this in a bar in Blue Island. I don't believe this. I mean, there was no two ways about it. I had to get this thing. So I went back in. We watched the, the Bulls game. And I said to my old boss, I said, so uh, how do I get a hold of this guy? Yeah, he's, well, he comes in here every week. He says, you want me to 
give me your phone number? And I said, yeah, let me, let's do that. So I gave him my phone number. Now, folks, remember, this guy has no idea that I'm an Elvis Presley dealer or that I know anything about Elvis Presley. He thinks I work, I, I just deal in antiques. I get a call from the guy and uh, he invites me to his house. So I get there and uh, the, the guy brings out a box, okay, of, of stuff that uh, belonged to his sister. He actually had a napkin with Barbara Streisand's signature on it. All I remember, because this was a while ago, folks, I, I don't remember everything, but I, I, I remember him telling me the story about, you know, her signing the, this, this napkin. It looked like there was like 10,000, I can't remember, but it was the amount of money that she owed and, and Streisand had signed it. And, and from what he told me, his sister had told him, Barbara Streisand opened up the International Hotel because she had to pay off a debt. <laughs> As I said, I probably should have bought that. I should have got it anyway, just for the historic significance. So I asked him, I said, well, how did your sister get this contract? And he said, well, she collected autographs. He says, if you look in there, you'll see them. And sure enough, there were napkins in there with Sammy Davis Jr. signed. Uh, Wayne Newton had signed. There's business cards signed by Sinatra. There's all these all these signatures from all these performers. I think she worked for Alex Shufi, I think. I'm pretty sure. And every time a performer came into the offices and stuff, she would get the autograph. Well, the only autograph she never got was Elvis. So when she retired and left the job... She stole it. <laughs> Apparently, from what he said, she went in the cabinet and she took the contract. Wow. Okay. So that's one way of getting an Elvis signature, right? She only got it for the autograph. So this guy only thought of it as an autograph, just like my old boss. It's just Elvis's autograph. They didn't realize the historic significance of that. What I did was after I got the contract, I um I made this this thing here. It's a it's a frame, and and originally when I did it, the original contract was in it, and I I took it to a few shows. I showed it to different people because once I got it, I had to find out as much information as, as I could. Well, if you'll notice in the picture here up on top, and if I move my oh there it is right here. This guy right. Here is Alex Shufi, and of course, this is Elvis. I don't know who this is. If you find the original photo and look carefully at the photo, you'll notice that Alex Shufi is signing the contract with a pen that's like a Sharpie. It's a, it's a pen that was used uh, on the sites when pens didn't work, so they could mark on anything. So it was a construction site pen. And then Elvis is signing it with a regular pen. So right away I said, holy cow, this, is, this contract was signed on the site. I went up to Joe Esposito, who happened to be at the Portage, Indiana uh, uh, Fan Fest that I used to do. And Joe was there, and I brought him over to my table, and I showed him this exact thing here. And I said, Joe, what do you know about this? So Joe Esposito, and who everybody knows was Elvis' closest friend, who just passed away recently. Great guy. Uh, I could tell you stories about him that, that are fantastic. He looked at it and he says, okay, I know what that is. He says, that's a contract that Elvis signed for the photo shoot. That's not the real contract because it was missing money. That's one thing I noticed about the contract is there was no, there were no, there was no money mentioned. All it said is that Elvis would perform, that he was going to be there and the projected dates. And that was it. So Joe, Joe made it more specific. He said that when they were building the hotel, Alex Shufi had them come out. They went out there on the site for publicity, and they brought a, a, like this contract along, a blank contract, and then Elvis signed it, which is what you see him doing up here. He signed it just for the cameras, and they, there's even footage of him signing it, which was great because when I saw the footage, I could see the pens. So I knew I, for sure that this was what he what he signed technically what the contract was was it was basically an agreement to uh, to agree okay it was still a contract it's still legit but in many ways it was rarer than the actual contract that was filled out that finished up with it had all the money 
and all of the details added to it. I mean, this was the biggest thing as an Elvis fan or Elvis collector or dealer that I had ever found in my life. And you can bet I held on to it. <laughs> I had that for a long time. I had this contract for a long time. As you can see, like I said, I put it in a frame. What's in there now is a copy of it because I had a copy made because I knew if I ever sold it, I wanted something to remember it by because, you know, in my lifetime as a dealer and as a collector, this is my lost ark. This is the holy grail. This is the biggest thing I had ever found. And it was a piece of history. It was a collector's item. And uh, like I said, I, hang on, I hung on to it for a very long time uh, until, again, when you need money, you got to get money, right? So I, I found a, a, a guy who bought it, and uh, no names mentioned, but he's a great guy, and he has it to this day. He's very proud of it. I think he even had it restored, and I think he, he keeps it in a safe I think he said in a bank or something. You you find this stuff in the most unlikely places. I just went to a to a bar to have a drink and watch a game. And lo and behold, I get this thing dropped in my lap as if it was a gift from God. So it was a great find, folks. And I really uh really excited. Very sad that I don't have it no more. But I do have this this frame. And uh like I said, it's something I can remember it by. I'd love to hear in the comment section any of your discoveries or something that you found that was really phenomenal or exciting. You know, the hunt goes on. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because I love doing it. And as a collector, like I said, you never know what you're going to find. Our next show is actually going to be part two of my interview with Elvis book author, Joe Tunzi. What happened was, uh, for those of you who watched the last episode, we had, you know, it was all about Elvis on tape. So when Joe came by, we 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 recorded almost an hour and 15 minutes worth of, of stuff. And in order for me to be specific and keep it to the show, I just showed you the section of us talking about his book and about Elvis on tape. But before that, we talked for almost a half hour on Joe Tunzi himself. Let's talk about you and how you got started, or what what was the magic moment that got you, uh, that made you an Elvis fan? It was the uh, Frank Sinatra show. Um, my dad was a Frank Sinatra fan. You know, being Italian, um, he loved Frank Sinatra and Mario Lanza. So he made a point for all of us to gather around the uh, TV to watch Frank Sinatra, and it happened to be the Timex special. Mm. Welcome home, Elvis. Mm -hmm. What was your What was your first book? And tell me how you decided to get into publishing books, especially about Elvis. Yeah, it was uh, 1988. There was uh, the video, another area of collecting mm -hmm. that I touched upon in a book called the the first Elvis video price and reference guide, which was wow. a, which was just something that I was kind of driven by all these collectible books, not only on Elvis, but, you know, uh, coins, pottery, movie posters. And I thought, well, what about a book on Elvis video since this is a new wave of, mm. uh, of, of interest? It was a great, it was just a great interview. So those of you who enjoyed uh, episode seven, be prepared for episode nine, the next show with uh, part two. So that about wraps things up. And uh, just want to remind everybody that my business, Sounds Good Records, is still in business. And you can contact me at collectingthekeng at gmail.com. And uh, if you have a want list or something you're looking for, uh, you want to buy or sell or anything like that, just contact me there at that address. And I'll be glad to get back in touch with you. Also want to remind you to subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We need you to do that, folks, because that keeps us alive. That, let, that lets us know that you're interested. It lets YouTube know that you're interested. So it's very important if we're going to keep doing this that we have you subscribe to the channel. So don't forget to click that little button and subscribe. All right? Make sure you do that. All right? Thanks again for watching. I am Robert Alanese. This is the Collecting the King Show, and I am out of here.
Robert has left the building. Thank you and good night. Is that okay? Are we done?